Good morning. Um, nice to have so many people here on Sunday morning. <laughs> I didn't expect it, actually. Um, so my talk uh, is about the IntelliJ platform. Um, my name is Jan Cibron. I work as a developer advocate for JetBrains, and I'm responsible for everything around tooling, helping plugin developers, extending um, our IDEs and stuff like that. Um, please excuse my voice. I have a pretty bad cold since yesterday, of course, so maybe I need a few uh, breaks in between. So what is this talk about? Um, first, I want to introduce the IntelliJ platform on a very high level, basically. Um, who's using IntelliJ or any of the related? Oh, OK. So that's uh, quite a lot of people. Um, who doesn't know anything about the IntelliJ IDEs? OK, everyone has heard of them, at least. <laughs> that's good. Um, so that's, that's the first part of this talk, uh, a couple of slides. and. Um, after that, I want to show the actual tooling uh, that we provide to plugin developers. And I will also demonstrate or show screenshots, at least, of some of the internal tools we use at JetBrains uh, to make sure that plugin developers enjoy our platform. So we try to help them as well um, by using uh, some internal tools and making sure that things work smoothly for everyone. So the IntelliJ platform. Um, came out of IntelliJ IDEA, the IDE, uh, which used to be um, commercial IDE only. Um, we split that into community edition, which is completely open sourced under Apache 2 license uh, since 2009. And there's, of course, still the commercial IDE or other IDEs based on the um, IntelliJ platform. Um, it's a JVM-based IDE, just like NetBeans and um, Eclipse. So we use mostly Kotlin, uh, sorry, we use mostly Java, some Kotlin, or increasing amount of Kotlin, and a few bits here and there of uh, Groovy code um, as well. Um, the user interface is actually built completely on Swing, and most people are like, what? <laughs> you can actually build like complex Swing um, applications? Yes, you can. Um, it is quite painful sometimes, uh, especially when you want to support the same level uh, across Mac, Linux, and uh, Windows. Um, but we are lucky enough that we have um, actually a couple of uh, very talented um, people from the former Swing team who now work for JetBrains and um, who built their own um, OpenJDK-based runtime, which we use for our IDEs now. So that's another thing that is somewhat related to the IntelliJ platform. Um, we use our own uh, Java runtime um, based on OpenJDK. So it's also completely free um, for everyone. And we merge back to OpenJDK as well. One important distinction to make um, between uh, IntelliJ and NetBeans and Eclipse is that the IntelliJ platform is not a generic um, framework or not a framework for generic applications. So it is not intended to be used for like customer applications or anything that is not an IDE or something that is somewhat <laughs> an IDE. Um, and this is a very important point to make, so please don't try to do it. It's, it is just too specialized and um, it is pretty much impossible to rip out the parts which would just give you the basic uh, layer for running an application and having some kind of UI. The last uh, line on the slide is a link to a presentation which uh, a colleague of mine made a couple of years ago. So it's a bit outdated, but it still shows like the whole evolution of the IntelliJ platform and how things work together or developed if, if you're interested in a bit more of history. So how can you approach writing plugins? Um, for the IntelliJ platform. So the community um, repository is basically the uh, IntelliJ platform. We have no distinction between the community edition of IntelliJ and the platform as such. It is one repository and one name. Um, it's published on GitHub as well. Uh, we accept pull requests, um, any kind of feedback on that as well, of course. Um, the second link is the um, SDK documentation. So that's some uh, high-level docs around the IntelliJ platform, which uh, help you learn it, um, understand all the different parts of it, 
and um, it also has some tutorials or um, self-learned trails basically if for example if you want to write a custom language pl plugin there's a nice detailed uh, introduction in how to approach this um, JetBrains runs a couple of forums. One of them is specialized to help plugin developers or anyone building stuff on the IntelliJ platform. Uh, we do monitor this. It's actually one of my tasks to do this and try to help answer all the questions in a timely manner. Um, there's also a, a Gitter um, community run chat uh, where actually quite a lot of very active plugin developers um, are hanging around as well. So if you need a quick answer, you might get lucky there as well. Sometimes I've, I look there as well. If you want to keep up to date, uh, we run a blog and um, Twitter account, of course, so um, you get all like the high level news um, about the IntelliJ platform. So plugins, um, there's actually a quite huge number. Um, Anytime I talk about the IntelliJ platform, I have to go on our website, which lists all the plugins, and look up the new number, and it increases um, more and more. Um, what kind of plugins can you build for IntelliJ? Well, basically anything that you can think of. So uh, one very um, popular category is, of course, like uh, custom languages, um, any kind of framework support, so any kind of web application support, for example. Um, there's a lot of little tools, helpers, kind of stuff of plugins um, being published there as well. And um, yeah, so it, it's a very broad offering that you have. And actually, most of them are open source or at least um, uh, free for use. The plugins website lists all of them, so um, that's one way to, to um, search for them. Uh, you can see all the different versions and stuff of them. We are going to take a look uh, a bit later. Um, Marketplace is um, a thing we are currently developing in JetBrains, which will help plugin developers to actually monetize the plugins if they want to. Uh, we are also considering uh, using this platform for uh, donation-based plugins. So maybe that's also something interesting for purely open source plugins as well in, in the future. Of course, you can build IDEs on the IntelliJ platform. Um, so there's a couple of them by JetBrains. Uh, we try to cover all the most popular programming languages, obviously. Um, one of them is uh, very interesting from a technical point of view, which is um, Rider. It's a C-sharp.net IDE, uh, which runs as well on Mac as on Linux. So that's something quite unusual in the .NET world. Um, and it uses the IntelliJ platform just for the front end. So only the user interface is run by the IntelliJ platform. It feels and looks like one of the IDEs, but all the code intelligence and all the real functionality is actually run by a second process which runs ReSharper. And ReSharper is also a product which we have developed for a couple of years, which is originally a plugin for uh, Visual Studio. So we kind of combined the two worlds into one product, which allows us now to run um, a Visual Studio extension uh, cross-platform um, on all machines. Probably the most known um, IDE, which is not built by JetBrains, is Android Studio, um, which is like the official, Android, uh, official IDE for anything uh, Android-based. Uh, um, it was built by Google um, based on the Android plugin uh, we did before. There's also a couple of others. Uh, one of them is uh, Cuba Studio, that's like a web framework, and they basically um, provide a plugin, but as well um, a, f a full standalone IDE um, for their specific framework. Building IDEs is, of course, much more complicated than building a plugin. So we usually recommend to build a plugin, and if the plugin involves into something bigger, then think about distributing it as a standalone IDE later. So now we come to the uh, interesting developing parts. Um, these are the points I want to show to them uh, today. So the plugin development kit 
is, of course, a plugin in IntelliJ, which allows you or helps you um, writing plugins in IntelliJ. Um, the Gradle IntelliJ plugin is actually a plugin for the Gradle build system, which helps you write plugins for IntelliJ. So you can use Gradle and actually we highly recommend doing so now. Um, I will show a bit more details later. Um, the third one, Grammar Kit, is specifically targeted at custom language development. So anyone wanting to support a new um, custom language um, should really try uh, building it on Grammar Kit. And the last thing is a maintenance tool, Plugin Verifier, um, which helps you to ensure that the compatibility with newer or older versions of IntelliJ is actually uh, guaranteed. So now let's switch to the IDE. Um, and I want to show some basic uh, features of the plugin development um, <coughs> plugin uh, itself in the IDE. Um, so there's a couple of things. Um, basically, a plugin is built by the code, obviously, and uh, all the components are registered in a plugin descriptor <coughs> file, which is basically a, um, the XML file we are seeing here. It has all sorts of metadata, registration information um, about the actual functionality that the plugin exposes. And we have built a quite sophisticated support for um, editing all this XML. Um, so we can see all the uh, components here, for example. We have some metadata about the plugin itself, like name, ID, um, compatibility information here, and stuff like that. Um, and you have quite a nice um, tooling support in the XML file itself. So we don't like wizards in the IntelliJ world at all. We try to avoid them. Um, we try to build all the tooling based on textual editors because we think it's usually faster to type stuff or use tooling that helps you type faster than using um, UI-driven wizards. So for example, I have um, two extensions here which use the same extension point, so they provide a similar kind of functionality. And I have given them some kind of IDs. And this is interesting because then you can actually provide some kind of ordering for extensions. So for example, one extension can have priority over other extensions, your own ones or maybe even the built-in ones. So that's one way of overriding um, or extending existing functionality even from the platform. And we understand all of this. So we have auto completion here. I can uh, use go target here. I can do a find usages and stuff like that. Um, of course, all the extension points can be uh, auto-completed here as well. We can even go to the declaration here, look at the actual um, interface, which provides this extension point and stuff like this. We can then go back to the registration of this extension point and stuff like this. So this is all very nicely integrated in the, in the editor. And um, let's talk about compatibility because that's one very um, crucial point um, which actually caused quite a lot of trouble in the recent years but um, I think the tooling we have now will help make things better. Um, so we have three major releases a year now. We switched to that model um, some time ago and you can actually see the release date from the number. So 18.2 is basically the second release in 2018. And 183, of course, is the third release in 2018. So if you want a very generic compatibility, that's very easy to do like this. But you can also provide the full build number if you really need some changes in some kind of um, later point release. The thing I did now was to violate the compa uh, compatibility. So I specified 182 here. And actually, I cannot do this. Um, it's a bit small to read. So basically, what the message is saying is, I'm trying to use an extension point from a platform release that is newer than the minimum version I specified in my plugin descriptor. So I'm trying to use something that is not there, basically. 
Um, and that's quite easy to fix because I can just change now the minimum version, go back and the warning will disappear because now it's okay. It's now compatible, right? And another thing we added in, in the tooling um, just recently is that we have now these um, annotations here um, available since, um, which prints the exact build number when this class or even method was added to the platform so you can see when it will be available. What is the minimum version I need to specify in my plugin to be able to use this class? So this information and, and, and the um, inspection really helps you to ensure compatibility even before deploying or trying your plugin, um, you will be warned right in the editor. There's a couple of other highlightings in the plugin XML. Um, for example, we require um, um, a useful description. So if you just write one word, it will highlight this in, as an error because it's not useful for users to browse the plugin list and um, have no decent description, um, stuff like that. Um, same if you try to use Oh, no, it actually doesn't because I'm running in a special mode, but you would get the warning that you are not JetBrains, so you shouldn't specify JetBrains as plugin vendor, um, stuff like that. So we, we try to make um, all the um, appearance of plugins a bit more uniform and more useful for end users. Um, there is a couple of other features we have. <clears throat> so writing plugins, of course, means writing tests. Um, we prefer integration tests. So usually we fire up some kind of headless IDE instance and you test against this headless IDE instance. That's the way we usually write tests. So you need usually some kind of test data and then you perform some actions against this test data. For example, you have some, some file, and some Java file, and you want to test completion. You write, <coughs> you write this minimum Java file, you position the cursor at some specific point in the file, and then you invoke completion and then you test that the completion variants which are shown are actually the ones you want um, to be provided. So you need some kind of navigation between your testing code and the test data. And that's another feature that the Plugin Development Kit offers. For example, I, we have the special annotation here, test data pass. Um, so we can navigate there and see the related test data here as well. And navigate to the test data here. Okay, it's broken in this sample, of course, but usually it works. There's another new feature which we are going to um, announce a bit more publicly um, later this month, uh, which is uh, theming in the IDE. So um, the whole UI can uh, be basically, you can provide a custom theme for the UI, any colors, uh, margins, and stuff like this can now be customized. And that's also part of the plugin development kit to um, offer uh, tooling support for this customization. Um, as you can see, you get, for example, a preview for all the colors in, in your theme, but you also get uh, completion for all the customization keys, for example. So the, that's about some, just some of the features uh, we have in the plugin development kit. Um, now I want to show a bit of the uh, grammar plugin, grammar kit, plugin, sorry. Um, so how do you write custom language support in IntelliJ? Basically, you need a lexer which lexes the file into tokens, and um, then you need a parser which builds on top of that. And this is what GrammarKit offers you for tooling, so it's very easy to write a lexer and as well basically generate a parser based on some BNF notation for the parsing. And I will make this part a bit shorter because uh, time is tight here, but you have all sorts of tooling support here for writing the parser BNF file, generate the parser code. Uh, we can even uh, do a live preview of our parser without actually compiling code or, or doing anything. So um, now I can test my 
parser here, and as soon as I write something illegal, I can see that my parser actually does what it should do, only allow numbers and, and, and stuff like that. Um, the lexing is done by JFlex, um, which is a very popular um, framework for that kind. And we have all sorts of tooling support with this as well. Sorry, this is the JFlex file. So custom highlighting here and completion as well. The technology for the parser is actually, uh, um, it's homegrown. <laughs> so the parsing is incremental. We only parse changed parts of, of the file. Um, so all the parsing um, is done in real time, more or less, while you type. So. Uh, the parser generator is um, completely home homegrown. So the, the code generated is really built by the plugin itself. Yeah. There's no Antler or something behind that, no. You can use Antler, but yeah, we prefer our own homegrown stuff for various reasons. Yes, the grammar kit is also free. Uh, it's a separate plugin because not many people use it, obviously, but it's free to use, of course. So that's the grammar kit plugin. And um, the last thing I have on my list here is the plugin verifier. And we are going to take a look at this. Um, so the plugin verifier runs on the plugin repository, um, which hosts all the plugins for downloading and um, in the IDE directly. But you can also install it locally and run it locally if you really want. Um, but we are going to take a look at the instance on the plugins repository. And I'm going to open the website because it's a bit nicer. So this is what it looks like. I've run a compatibility test against a specific IDE version and it failed, um, expectedly. <laughs> Um, and these are all the kinds of problems we, we catch now, like the method is not found, um, the class is not existing anymore in this platform version. Um, incompatible binary changes in the platform, they shouldn't happen, but maybe they happen for some kind of reason, so you must update those uh, references and stuff like this. You are still using deprecated API, so you get all these warnings, and they really help you to make your plugin compatible with newer releases and fix all these issues one by one and upload a new, uh, better or more compatible version um, for the latest releases. Um, you can also see all the dependencies um, that your plugin really has uh, at runtime, for example. Does it work with the Reflection API to internal APIs? Okay, so the question is, does it work with Reflection uh, for internal APIs? Um, Yes and no. Um, so it's bytecode-based um, analysis, obviously. We cannot catch every dirty trick you might or might not do um, using our platform. Um, so yeah, of course, we recommend using the API as is and not try to hack into package private stuff, for example, or even private stuff. Um, if you feel the need to, please talk to us first. Maybe we will agree opening it <laughs> instead. So that's, that's all the tooling which is available um, for um, any plugin developer. All the tools I just showed are completely free and uh, completely open sourced. Um, so are the SDK docs. We also want and encourage contributions to that as well. And now I'm showing two screenshots of um, internal tools we use in JetBrains um, to highlight um, some of the efforts we do to ensure stability. So the first one is IntelliJ API Watcher. Um, it is basically um, a tool we run on all the plugins which are hosted on the plugin repository. So we know what people are using. So before we try and delete, for example, some deprecated method, we can run this uh, usage check and make sure that there are no more plugins using it. Or if we change some method signature, we can ensure that compatibility is not broken. Stuff like that. Um, so that really prevents us breaking the platform and all of a sudden a number of plugins just stop working for some binary uh, compatibility issues. 
The second tool we use um, currently only internal is uh, exception analyzer. So if there's some kind of exception in the IDE, you have the ability to report it to us. Um, and it, it includes the exception stack trace, some message. You can also provide some additional details if you want. Um, in some cases, the current file is attached to it um, if you allow it. Um, so we can uh, use this for diagnosis. And this exception analyzer helps us to classify and assign and group <coughs> all the exception reports and assign them to the responsible developer. This is currently internal only, but we are really thinking about opening up a similar tool for plugin um, developers as well on the plugin repository. So this is something that might come in the future. There are, of course, a, a lot more tools in the plugin developer toolkit um, than I could show in a couple of minutes today. Um, we try to increase the documentation for all this as well. Um, one thing that is really important is the so-called internal mode in the IDE, so that's the last thing I want to show today. Um, and what it gives you is this internal menu here, which has all sorts of debugging and inspection um, tools for you to use. And one of them is the UI inspector, for example, which um, allows you to alt control click into any UI element and navigate the whole swing hierarchy of that element to inspect it, for example. Understand what components are we using to build this UI so you can use the same ones uh, for your UI or debug your UI, for example. Um, there's really a huge number of, of uh, stuff here. Um, you can um, test various components. Um, you can see um, so-called dis disposer trees. Um, you can see the biggest components, the biggest chain of uh, UI components and stuff like this. So it really helps you to debug all sorts of problems um, which you might encounter while writing plugins. Okay, with that, I guess I'm done using my time to showcase some stuff, so I'm happy to take a couple of questions if time permits. Yes? So, any more questions? Yes, please. In the beginning, when you showed us uh, XML with a command yes. mm -hmm. fill, uh, fill um, my question is you showed us a huge list of yes. commands mm -hmm. that we're to put in here. Uh, how, if I am a developer, I don't know this one. Mm -hmm. How can I navigate which is the correct part for me? And yeah. What about documentation in this part? Yeah. Because sometimes documentation is more important yeah. than the tools. Yeah. So the, the question is basically, um, how do I know which extensions to use and what they do actually, and how to find out more about them? Um, yeah. So. That is actually one of the hardest parts for Plugin Writer because the platform just offers so many um, extension points um, and possibilities. Um, usually it's better to ask, I want to build this and that, or look in the documentation, and then we will also guide you to the correct uh, extension points you want to use for this. For example, if you want to build a custom language, there's a set of specific extension points you probably want to use, and they are listed in, in the documentation. Um, a number of them have Java doc. You can invoke Java doc um, even in the editor there, so you can see some in, in the XML file when, when you have the completion open, you can invoke Java doc there as well. If you are unsure, navigate to the extension point declaration itself to look for more documentation or information. So, but yeah, we usually prefer if people ask what they want to build or look up what they want to build and then we guide them to the correct ones. Okay.